Hello everyone, our topic today is placenta previa. This is my second video in the series of antipartum hemorrhage. I wish you will like it. By the end of this uh, video, we will be able to know the main risk factors of placenta previa, the pathophysiology and the degrees of placenta previa, the effect of this condition on the mother and the baby, and the main lines of management of a patient presented with a placenta previa. So what is placenta previa? Placenta previa is defined as an abnormal placentation, sorry, an abnormal implantation of the placenta at the internal cervical os. So normally when the placenta is formed during the first trimester of pregnancy, it will be implanted in the upper part of the uterus near the fundus, uh, or let's uh, say at uh, the upper uterine segment. However, in few percent of pregnancies, the placenta will implant in the lower uterine segment. This condition affects about 0.5% of all pregnancies, and it is the second most common cause of antipartum hemorrhage, responsible for 20% of cases of antipartum hemorrhage, and coming next to uh, placental abruption, which is the most common cause. This condition carries a high perinatal mortality rate up to 10 times higher than the general population and mostly due to the risk of preterm delivery. So, why would a placenta implant in the lower uterine segment? So, this picture shows us the lower uterine segment in bright blue. Normally, this segment is absent from the uterus. It is formed during the third trimester of pregnancy. So it is not found in the non-gravity uterus and it is not found in the first two trimesters of pregnancy. Most, in most of the cases, the placenta will implant in the upper part of the uterus in the dark blue part of this picture. However, in about 5% of cases, it will implant in the lower part of the uterus this occurs during the first trimester of a pregnancy. In 5% of cases, the placenta implants in the lower part of the uterus. However, most of these low implanted placenta will migrate to the upper part of the uterus by the third trimester of a pregnancy. And only 0.5% of all placenta will remain in the lower uterine segment. So, how this process of placental migration occurs when the placenta is implanted in the lower part of the uterus and when the lower uterine segment is formed during the third trimester of pregnancy, the placenta will grow towards the fundus and it will undergo atrophy towards the lower uterine segment uh, because the fundus has more blood supply, has better blood supply than the lower uterine segment. So this is a process of a pre preferential placental growth towards the uh, fundus. It is called the placental migration. However, a few cases, about 0.5%, the placenta will not undergo this process of preferential growth and it will remain in the lower uterine segment. So, what is the effect of the placenta if it will remain in the lower uterine segment? So. As I said, this lower uterine segment is formed during the third trimester of the pregnancy in a preparation for the descent of the baby and its delivery. So, it will undergo continuous growth and stretching during the third trimester. So, when this lower uterine segment is stretched, the blood vessels within the placenta will tear, and this will result in bleeding. So, this is the sort of bleeding in case of a placenta previa. It is the stretching of the lower uterine segment that causes tearing of the blood vessels within the placenta, which is implanted in the lower uterine segment. So this is the pathophysiology of placenta previa. Now, placenta previa is classified according to its proximity from the internal cervical os. You can see at the um, left side of the or at the right side of the screen, a marginal placenta previa. And this is the placenta that is only touching the internal cervical os. It is not covering the internal cervical os, it is only touching it. On the far left of the screen, 
we can see a partial placenta previa that is only partially covering the internal cervical os and in the middle we see a complete placenta previa which is completely covering the internal cervical os and from both sides so, so these are the three degrees of a placenta previa we have marginal placenta previa partial placenta previa and complete placenta previa now this is the classification of placenta previa what are the main risk factors for developing placenta previa now the single most important risk factor is the uh, previous uterine scar for example previous cesarean section this is the single most important risk factor as I said the incidence of a placenta previa is about 0.5 percent in the general population however if the mother have has a previous scar due to cesarean section this incidence will rise up to 4 percent probably and this is the most important risk factor other risk factors include scars from other surgeries like myomectomy smoking advanced maternal age multi-party multiple pregnancy all uh, are risk factors for developing placenta previa of different degree okay now having a previous scar not only put a risk for developing a placenta previa but also for developing a second condition known as morbidly adherent placenta this is this is the condition in which the placenta will adhere to the uterine wall in which case it is called placenta accreta if the placenta invades through the uterine wall it is called the placenta increta and if it penetrates the uterine wall towards the adjacent structures in the pelvis it is called the placenta paracreta and as you can see in this picture this condition of morbidly adherent placenta affects about five percent of patients with a placenta previa so having a placenta previa increases the risk of developing more morbidly adherent to placenta and this condition is associated with severe intrapartum bleeding uh, or intraoperative bleeding during cesarean section that is why we should inform our patient that she may end with cesarean hysterectomy she first must prepare a large amount of blood before the operation and we tell her that uh, there is a very high chance to have a cesarean hysterectomy now what is the main clinical clinical features of placenta previa the hallmark of this condition is painless vaginal bleeding during late second trimester or early third trimester so this is the usual presentation of placenta previa the mother comes in the early third trimester around the 30th week of gestation with vaginal bleeding and in most of the cases this bleeding is painless now what are the points to focus on when taking history from a mother presented with vaginal bleeding I discussed this history in the previous video we ask about the character of bleeding and in case of placenta previa this uh, bleeding is usually sudden the first episode occurs around the 30th week of gestation it is called the sentinel bleeding this is usually sudden but self-limited but it will recur and when it recur it will become more uh, profuse the bleeding is usually a bright red in case of a placenta previa and without any clots and as i said the, ble the bleeding is painless however presence of pain will not exclude placenta previa placenta previa can be painful in two conditions first if it is associated with a placental abruption and second if the mother has entered labor so presence of pain will not exclude placenta previa and that is why every patient presented to you with vaginal bleeding you should take an ultrasound even if there is pain and this ultrasound will diagnose or exclude placenta previa we should also uh, ask about a triggering factor uh, in most of the cases the bleeding occurs second uh, suddenly without any uh, of, um, triggering factor but sometimes there is a triggering factor like an intercourse fetal movement we must check uh, fetal movement and in a placenta previa the fetal movement are, are usually uh, positive because the fetus is affected late in placenta previa 
Uh, and we ask about the risk factors, and uh, as I said, the main risk factor is having a previous uterine scar, also advanced maternal age, smoking, multiparity, and multiple pregnancy, and also another risk factor is in vitro fertilization. No. Uh, in case of placenta accreta, uh, or uh, let us say a morbidly adherent placenta, the condition is usually asymptomatic, and uh, maybe it is diagnosed during the operation. Uh, however, in few cases of pericleta, uh, if the placenta is penetrating to the bladder, the, uh, the patient may be presented with hematuria, or into the rectum, the patient may be presented with hematochesia, that is a bleeding during defecation. So uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a trick that may come in the exam. Now, uh, on examination, first of all, we should check the vital signs. We should check that the mother is stable, and then we, we will examine the abdomen, and uh, usually the abdomen is soft and non-tender, and the uterus is not contracting if the case is a placenta previa. Also, we would notice that there is mild presentation of the baby. A placenta previa causes mild presentation and mild positioning because uh, it, it is occupying the lower uterine uh, segment, so it is like a competition between the baby and the placenta for the lower uterine segment and it kind of predisposed to mild presentations like um, uh, breach of presentation and uh, as you know uh, digital examination is contraindicated in a case of uh, uh, vaginal bleeding and postpartum hemorrhage because uh, a bleeding because uh, the digital examination can uh, trigger a profuse episode of bleeding in case of a placenta previa. Now, the best tool for diagnosing a placenta previa is an ultrasound scan, and the most accurate test is the transvaginal ultrasound. Transvaginal ultrasound does not carry a risk of bleeding, and it is better than transabdominal ultrasound. Transabdominal ultrasound has um, a sensitivity of about 95% because uh, uh, trans uh, abdominal ultrasound can miss a posterior placenta previa and this can be diagnosed on transvaginal ultrasound also also you will you will send the usual investigations complete a blood count looking for the hemoglobin uh, also a clotting study uh, cross match and prepare blood and uh, liver function test and renal function uh, test uh, and uh, klein heart test if the patient is RH uh, negative. Uh, this is done in any case of antipartum hemorrhage. This is an ultrasound scan. You can see here that uh, PL is for placenta and CX is for the cervix. And here, here is the placenta is covering the cervix. So this is, this is a case of placenta previa diagnosed by an ultrasound scan. Okay, now. What are the main lines of management of a patient with a placenta previa? Management depends on the degree of bleeding, the amount of bleeding, and the gestational age. Now, if the patient is presented with massive bleeding, regardless of the gestational age, we should run the uh, protocol for uh, massive bleeding, which I discussed in the previous video. We should stabilize the mother, check the airway, put oxygen, and check her circulation, put two IV cannuli, uh, send your investigations, prepare blood, uh, replace with a crystalloid until the blood came, until the blood comes for you, and also prepare for uh, platelets, cryoprecipitate, fresh frozen plasma, and then we check the condition of the baby and decide on delivery and in case of a placenta previa the delivery is by cesarean delivery if the episode is a mild bleeding that is a bleeding is uh, has stopped or it is very mild it depends on the gestational age now if the mother is in term has reached term uh, more than 37 weeks of gestation we should consider inducing delivery because induction of delivery is better than spontaneous delivery and it carries a uh, lesser risk for postpartum hemorrhage. If the patient is a preterm, for example, um, in the early second trimester, that is just more than 20 weeks of gestation, here 
as I said, the placenta in most of the cases will migrate as the pregnancy uh, proceeds. So uh, we should tell the mother that uh, she should have a bed rest, pelvic rest, avoid intercourse, and she should check uh, uh, her antenatal care more intensely, and the placenta will migrate in most of the cases. If the placenta persists up to the uh, early third trimester, when in the early third trimester, placenta previa will most likely fail to migrate uh, after that. So we also try to prolong the pregnancy to achieve uh, maturity of the fetus. So also, the mother should have a bed rest, complete pelvic rest. We should uh, tell her that she will need more intense antenatal care. The uh, condition of the baby should be checked uh, every two weeks. And uh, we should consider giving uh, corticosteroids to achieve fetal lung maturity. However, in 70% of cases, these patients will have an episode of bleeding that will require delivery before 34 weeks of gestation. Now, if the mother succeeded and reached uh, 36 weeks uh, of gestation, we can do an amniocentesis to uh, see if the fetal lung has matured. And when we reach fetal lung maturity, we will induce labor. So these are the main lines of management. Indications for immediate cesarean section in case of any antipartum hemorrhage are. If the patient has entered labor, if the patient is having massive bleeding, that is a bleeding of more than one liter or uh, less than one liter with the patient going into shock and any uh, features of fetal distress. In these conditions, we must do immediate cesarean delivery regardless of the gestational age. And uh, the mode of delivery in a placenta previa is almost always by cesarean delivery. And this concludes our topic today of placenta previa. Um, next video will be about placental uh, abruption. Thank you.